we were at the inflection point where we really need a partner to help us to grow and um, in, a, in a larger scale to support uh, our customers and provide end-to-end -end solutions. In this episode of Investors and Operators, I chat with Ruby Tai, who is CEO and co-founder of Applied Stem Cell, a portfolio company of QHP Capital, which is a client of 51 Labs. This is going to be a fascinating discussion about stem cells and how their gene editing technology at ASD could reverse disease, restore damaged organs, and ultimately, hopefully, cure many life-threatening conditions. We're also going to talk about Ruby's journey as an entrepreneur and recent partnership with QHP. Ruby, first, I loved shooting that video together uh, at your office in San Francisco. I went die, I dive deep into stem cells. It was an absolute blast. But can you kind of set the context here about what is applied stem cell? What do you focus on? Uh, thank you, uh, Jordan, first of all, uh, for the introduction. So um, Applied Stem Cell is a cell gene therapy CRO, CDMO, providing end-to-end -end solutions for cell gene product development using our comprehensive and proprietary stem cell gene editing technology. So I think many people have heard of CRISPR. It's become popularized now, but I don't think people really understand what the problem is, what's being solved. And I, if I remember correctly from the video shoot we did, it was something like it takes months and like half a million dollars just to get one dose for a patient to get cell therapy. Why? What is the problem? What's going on here? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so, um, you know, everybody knows cell gene therapy offers not only treatment, but also cure for many intractable diseases is very promising, right? However, bottlenecks for current cell therapies are several. So for example, the approved CAR T therapy on the market costs about half a million dollars per dose. And patients usually need two to three doses. So in total, it costs about a couple million dollars per patient. Very expensive, right? And another big drawback is time. It takes a couple of months at least to manufacture the cells. And in some cases, this is a life and death situation for some patients. And um, this is mainly because the current cell therapies are so-called autologous, meaning one product for one patient. Okay, so the, um, the way that the current manufacturing process is that if a patient wants to get cell therapy, they get their blood draw and have the cells manipulated in the lab and then get the cells re-injected back into their body. So our goal is to offer off-the-shelf products so that patients do not have to wait for months. And this also means one product for many patients therefore reducing cost dramatic. How do people currently pay for half a million dollars for one dose? Well, not many people can do that, as you can imagine. So it's in the U.S. Uh, so um, actually some of the rare diseases, uh, fortunately, can be paid by insurance. And it's also by installment. Uh, and some um, drug developers, drug manufacturers, they actually um, do it as like success payment. So if it's effective, the patient pays it, right? So, so there are different ways of doing it currently, but it's still, that's a big roadblock. And with the current cost, not many people have access to this um, new product. It, and what would it, yeah, what would it look like you know, if we're currently at $500,000 per dose and a patient needs two to three doses, what does the target state look like maybe three to five years from now? Like, what are you guys kind of building toward for cost? Right. So 
So we are, our ultimate goal is to really reduce to the range where everybody can afford it, right? So that's really our ultimate goal. And it may take a while, right? So when I say in a range that everybody can afford this, I'm looking at like say 5,000, right? $5,000 per dose. And it may take many years to reach that point, but we're trying to do what we can to incrementally reduce this cost. Like maybe the first step is to reduce by tenfold. That's a big achievement, half million to $50,000. And that's more acceptable already, right? So um, so that's what we're trying to do. So the way we you know, try to reach that goal um, is really to do what we so-called allogeneic. So meaning that one product can be used for many patients. So by itself, you so basically it's off the shelf and it's made for many patients. So that will dramatically reduce the cost of the product. So let's kind of dive into some of the science here. And if we could bring it maybe back to like high school, potentially middle school biology, because I'm uh, I'm still confused. And I did a like six months. Now this could be just my personal lack of education in science. But first off, what is a stem cell? What are iPSCs? And then what are the different technologies or platforms that you have developed? Yeah, so so let's just um, do stem cell 101 here. Okay, so, Thank so you. the way <laughs> we're trying to do this basic off-the-shelf product is start from stem cells. So now stem cells, more specifically iPSC, are self-renewable meaning that these cells provide unlimited source of starting materials for cell products. So unlimited, so that's the important word because the stem cell can renew by itself, right? And the other important feature of iPSC is that iPSC can become any type of human cell. So iPSC stands for induced pluripotent stem cell. Pluripotent means the cell type, this particular one cell can become any type of human cells. You know, you can think about your brain cells, your heart cells, your liver cells, basically just from one iPSC, it can become any type of human cells. So that's really what stem cell is. So now you can understand the potential of stem cells, right? First of all, it provides unlimited source of starting materials, then it can become any type of cells. So it's almost like a, a cell that's like a universal cell that can become any type of cell. Right? And, and where do you get these? Is it just scratch your skin and there's a stem cell? You know, sorry yes. to- Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Any adult cells. Okay. It could be just skin cells. It could be blood, right? So you can draw some blood and make into iPSC and uh, any other tissues. And we were even successful from urine samples. You can do that. So that's so, really the power of iPSC. And uh, that's why, you know, Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize about six years after he discovered iPSC. That's really short time between discovery and Nobel Prize winning, right? So it really speaks highly of this technology. And so we once you have the... Yeah, we, right. sorry to interrupt it, but... We basically, you know, be working with IPSC ever since the IPSC was discovered back in 2007. Now, uh, so IPSCs are like the, the building blocks that you then use. They're like the hardware that you then use your software to use it. Am I, am I completely butchering this uh, example here? I'm like, no, what no, do no. you actually do with the IPSCs to... Um, I mean, what's the biotechnology here? Right. right. No, that's a very good analogy. So it's really, IPSC is the starting material, or you can call it building blocks, right? And, and what we do is IPSC by itself is not a, a product, okay? It's just cell. So we basically, um, using our I, IPSC technology, meaning actually differentiate IPSC into adult cells. Right, so iPSC is stem cell, 
So we have technology to differentiate stem cells into specific cell types. So like just using one example, say we wanted to use the iPSC technology for cardio disease, okay? So we'll differentiate iPSC into cardiomyocytes. So that's the technology, that's the, that's the additional thing that we put in, right? The software that you mentioned that we put in to differentiate, to, to program the stem cells into cardiomyocytes. That's one thing. Another thing is gene editing plays a very important role, okay? So the cell in most time by cell is not sufficient. So some diseases are caused by genetic mutation. I'm just using a very simple example. And you have to somehow correct the faulty gene in order for the cells to function normally. So the way to do that is to do gene editing, right? So somehow then the gene will be functioning again um, by correcting the faulty gene. So you're so just rewriting the software here. Yes, so these are different softwares that we put in to the building block using your analogy. And that's the final thing. The final thing is the product. That's the cell product. That's the medicine. And what is the actual software to use this analogy? I, I saw on the website with Target, like what is Target? What makes it unique? What are the strengths of it? Right, so gene editing is, is a, a pretty big area. So there are multiple technology platform and people probably have heard CRISPR because uh, that's a very, it's a revolutionary technology for gene editing. And, um, but we, Applied Stem Cell has a unique technology. It's our own proprietary technology called the TAGAT. It's spelled as T-A-R-G-A-T-T, -T, TAGAT. And this technology, um, was invented when I was at Stanford University. Um, and now Applied Stem Cell has a exclusive uh, commercial rights from Stanford. And at Applied Stem Cell, we have continued to develop and improve the target technology for its application, in for, for mainly for therapeutic applications. And we're also in a process of developing and establishing the next generation target technology which is called SELECT, double S, SELECT. And um, so that's really um, a, a, a very important technology that we have developed. So going back to your question about these gene editing technology. So now what are the major differences between CRISPR and TAGET, right? So there's so many of these different technologies out there. And what, what are the advantages of TAGET, right? So basically, these are two, I call it complementary technologies for gene editing. It really depends on what kind of uh, gene editing you want to do, okay? So uh, CRISPR works very well for like knocking out genes, right? For basically get rid of a gene or making small, very small changes to a gene, like inserting a very small piece of fragment. However, CRISPR does not work efficiently with large fragment DNA insertion. This is very important for some for a lot of cell therapy. So all the cell therapy right now on the market, but the CAR T therapy, they all need to do gene insertion. And the fragment size are big. Okay. We're talking about 5 kb fragment, and CRISPR alone just doesn't work effectively enough for that purpose, right? And so, concern, so basically is the the application for the software is too big and the software just can't process the needs of the application. That's right. One technology is not enough, right? So this CRISPR technology is not enough. And this is where target comes in, okay? So target is for site specific gene insertion. So target allows large fragment insertion in a site-specific manner, in a safe genomic locus. So there are two things that's very important. Large fragment, so target allows up to 20 kb, which is a very big piece of DNA. You can put a lot of stuff in that 20 kb, okay? In some cases, that's very important because they're so, it, you, nowadays it's getting so complicated. You're not just putting one gene, you put multiple genes. So you need that payload. Um, so target allows that. 
A second thing is insertion in a safe genomic locus. Safe safety. Safety is very important for product. So that's another thing CRISPR does have off target uh, then. So that's a safety concern, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, one is target is better than CRISPR or CRISPR is better than target, but it really depends on your application, right? So if you just want to knocking out a gene, use CRISPR, right? Or if you want to insert a gene, like CAR-T therapy, target is the way to go. And to kind of zoom out, what are the applications of just a quick gene insertion? Like, what are the scenarios or use cases of that? Yeah, so there, there are many applications like that, right? So one is you have to express a therapy. In most cases, you express therapeutic genes, right? So like CAR is basically, you express CAR T means you, you express a CAR gene so that it will target cancer cells, right? So CAR T is to target cancer cells. Without a CAR, you cannot target cancer cells. So putting in a CAR is critical, right? So that requires gene insertion. And then also for a lot of genetic diseases, like, you know, if you're missing a gene, um, uh, let's say um, hemophilia, right? Hemophilia. And because we worked, I, I, I used to work on hemophilia. And um, so hemophilia patients, they're missing uh, factor A, that particular gene, so they bleed, right? They cannot clot their blood. So then you need to insert a, a functional factor A gene into your genome. So that's another gene insertion example. And there are many other, you know, the gene therapy space, it's all inserting a gene. For that particular example with, a, I think it's hemophilia, from the first dose of therapy to the final dose, about how many months does it take to get to the target state or the next better state? Well, that's uh, maybe another topic, uh, maybe for another podcast. <laughs> this is because, you know, right now most, um, uh, like just for hemophilia, for genetic disease, it's gene therapy. So gene therapy has their problem because it's a viral, it uses viral vector. So AAV is a viral vector to carry the gene into your body, okay? And that's another bottleneck really is AAV manufacturing. It's so expensive. And so we are more focused in the cell part with manufacturing cells, not the virus. In fact, we, we don't want to use virus. So another thing I want to talk about here is that we don't use viral vector here. So that's even more cost saving, okay? So it's basically viral, ve viral vector manufacturing is one of the highest cost for manufacturing. So maybe we can shift over a little bit to the partnership with QHP and just kind of, if you could talk about where was the business, maybe a few months leading up to that partnership and then what were some of the considerations of going with QHP? And lastly, after you partnered, when you had that week-long offsite working with the team to really dive deep into the planning, it would be great to understand kind of that experience. Yeah, sure. So um, I kind of implied that um, uh, in my previous life, <laughs> so I was in the product development, right? So um, and when I was developing cell gene product, uh, I realized one big bottleneck in product development is really manufacturing. So as soon as I started running Apply Stem Cell, um, my first task is really to build our capability in uh, CIO, CDMO uh, to support cell gene therapy. Because I, I have the advantage of knowing the other side, knowing our, our, our clients' needs. And um, so, and we invested in building the infrastructure, the technology platform, the process uh, for cell product development. So we were at the inflection point where we really need a partner to help us to grow and um, in, a, in a larger scale to support uh, our customers 
and provide end-to-end -end solutions, really from you know early um, discovery stage, clinical trial stage, all the way through commercial. So I was really in the need of finding a partner. So that's really prompted us to look for a partner, right? And um, so I may have told you this already. So this process was very long. You know, it took about a year, right? And when we first started, um, you know, talking to people, basically we talked to anybody who wants to listen to us. And and I think I probably talked about 100 uh, potential partners. And um, and then when QHB came along. And they just kind of stood out. They just stood out for several reasons. And first of all, they really, they really believed in what we do. They believed in our technology and our innovation. So that's like they really believed in the science. They they really realized that our difference from other CDMOs are really our innovation, our technology, right? And our vision, you know, we talked about allogeneic cell therapy of the shelf product is the direction to go using iPSC and gene editing. And that they have the same vision. And they understood the industry. They understood the cell gene therapy industry. And they've been investing in healthcare for many, many years. And they focus in healthcare uh, investment. Not like some other partners we talked to, they invest in anything that, you know, makes money, I guess. But, I mean, that's fine, but... You know, but this they are more QHP is more specialized. So you and, didn't have to spend a lot of time answering these basic questions like I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, offense, no offense to you. You are correct. <laughs> they are, they're basically, they're, they they you know they they know it. They know to some extent more than me, right? And um, and so they the could see kind of how it fit is, into the larger ecosystem throughout not just your particular vertical, but the entire ecosystem within life sciences and healthcare. Exactly. They opened, they opened my eye, right? And um, so they provided us not only financial support, but I think more importantly, other resources. We really, really need it. So these resource, resources include expert advisors. And that was before we even signed agreement. The advisors, I was truly, truly impressed. I really, you know, I, you know, respect them. Um, they are industry, you know, veterans and provided very good advice. And especially in the cell gene product, CL, CDMO space. And also their portfolio companies. They have a wide range of portfolio companies. And I can really share, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, Frustration sometimes <laughs> that helps, right? And also resources that we have work, right? And uh, and just very recently, um, we were trained um, uh, by QHP on using their management system. And th they mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the management system, be you know, a few months back, and I didn't pay that much attention to it. But after you know, really learning it and uh, working on it. And now I understand why they are successful uh, in uh, managing all these portfolio companies. And so, and I'm really, you know, uh, I'm, I guess I, I'm so happy and so honored uh, to uh, work with uh, QHP. Let's, before we kind of dive into that week long management system install, what, what advice do you have for? sellers on what to expect in a sale process and maybe some key takeaways for, for uh, from your experience on kind of how to make it as smooth as possible, as painless as possible, even though no sale process is painless. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, uh, and also of course, every company is different, right? So my experience may not be applicable to others, uh, but as you said, um, this transaction, merger, acquisition, all these deals um, uh, takes a long time. <laughs> and um, I guess I was the lucky one to be able to close it. And, and many people actually, you know, they, they could do as, as much work as I did or even more and, and end up getting nowhere, right? So, um, 
And one thing is that um, I have to give credits to, you know, what, selecting a very good financial advisor is important. And um, I um, really want to get, give a pat on the back of uh, uh, Baird. They helped me, uh, they were my financial advisors. And um, another thing is really um, finding, you know, when you, at the, towards the end, you have several choices, you know, we did, right? And um, so there are things that you really need to consider. I, I can tell you that QHD wasn't the highest bidder, um, but why did we choose QHD? So there's many other factors, even more important than money sometimes, right? And um, so like I, I mentioned about resources and also just, uh, uh, I don't know what's the better word to put, the, the chemistry, maybe just like what I've been talking about, share the vision, share the passion. So that, like when I talk to QHP, I, I can see that already, you know, and they're so easy to work with. Uh, that's very important. You know, you need to have the same goals, same vision, right? So that's very important. And, um, and, and then also, you know, um, timing. And I you know it's hard to time things, but you know timing is also uh, a critical point. You know, uh, different buyers they offer different timeline, and then when this is so critical towards the end, timeline is very important. Don't just look at five extra million dollars. You need to look at many other things. I love it. What um, what was that management system install like? How did the week just kind of break down? Who was participating and what was kind of like where you started and where you went from the beginning of the week to the end of the week? Yeah, so that one week is probably one of the most productive week we had as a management team. And, you know, people have doubts, you know, when you go into, because we've done this kind of thing before, right? You always have like strategic planning and a management retreat. But this one is truly different. Uh, part of it, I think QHB is so experienced in running this management system. And they know, they know exactly what they're doing and how to do it successfully. And um, so before we go in that, they sent us two books to read. So that that's the preparation is also very important. And um, so uh, the blue book and the red book. Uh, so these are about, <laughs> wait, <laughs> these are about like wait. planning. Yeah, have you seen those books? I, I have. You have them? I got getting the right things done. Vern Vern gave this to me on our video shoot that we had at their office. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> is the that, red is, book. is this the red book? <laughs> yeah, that's the red book. And um so yeah, it, it was like um so reading, just reading through those books uh, to start with was very helpful. And then we would go into the week and uh, Vern, he, he just incredible, right? He, I call him my mentor. I don't know if you accept that, but I call him my mentor. And um, so he basically led the whole, con whole week uh, and so smoothly, it looked so easy on him, even though, you know, he, he he kept warning us it's going to be a painful process. He said, okay, maybe Monday is good, but by Wednesday, you guys are all going to hate me. So, so <laughs> But so then you'll we, come back to loving me on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the whole process, we only made him fall down on the floor once. So that's pretty good record, okay? <laughs> so... And most time he was happy with us. So that I guess he told us that this was one of his best training. But anyway, so what I want to say is that, you know, during that week, we clarified on our vision, our mission, our roles and responsibilities. I think that roles and responsibilities are so important because uh, we're a small company. We're used to like doing everything, you know, everybody is trying to do this and do that. And, but to some extent, it's not efficient, not effective, right? So everybody needs to have, you know, every function needs to have an owner and they were, they, they're accountable for that. Even though other people are helping, but we need to have a leader, owner 
that owns that function. So we clarify on that. And also, you what know, are some really things that, the process. What yeah. are some things that you were doing that you discovered throughout that week of the roles and responsibilities? Like, hey, I I, I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> or Oh my gosh, almost every function. I got, I was doing too much. Yeah. I was like, I was in people's way. I, I, I need to get out, you know? So, you know, my, my instinct is like, you know, I want to be involved in, so in solution, we call solution planning, solution development and sales marketing and all that and operation. And for me, I really should be focusing on strategy. Okay. So really the, the, the company's whole strategy, and I can help, but I shouldn't be the one who actually makes the decision. I should, there should be other owners and who will be doing that, right? I can provide my opinions. And so each function has a leader and a group of people to contribute. So that really clarified a lot of things. So my time can be better spent on the things a CEO should be doing. Is really, what are some of the specific yeah. functional things? So for example, if you look into sales, what are the limits of your new roles and responsibilities with sales? That's right. So my focus for sales marketing right now is in technology license. So that's the new thing that we really want to hit this year. Um, so because I actually, by training, I'm a scientist. Right. Yeah. And also I'm an inventor of Taga. So it I would be a best person to really drive that effort. I'm not just taking talking about licensed technologists, one time licensing to a company. My salespeople, they can do that. They are fully capable of doing that. What I'm talking about, what I want to do is really form long term partnership and using our technology with you know partners. Right. So you I'm need that space. Yeah. And so you need that space to think through the different ways to structure a partnership for each individual firm that you're thinking about partnering with and what's in it for them, what's in it for you, as opposed to just, okay, here's the overall framework, go sell that framework, but you need to have time and space to think about the framework. Exactly. I never had time to think about it in the past is like shotguns you know, approach, right? So if I see this company, okay, I do this. Now I can actually put, you know, all these things in structure, just like you said, right? Think about, you know, first of all, categorize these companies into different buckets, right? Because our te technology can be applicable to many different areas, right? So first of all, to, to divide into different buckets and then put a list of companies in each bucket and then for each company, I have to think about what kind of strategy we need to have, right? So those things need thinking, research, strategize. So I now I, I have time to do it by clarifying our roles and responsibility. Are there any other functional areas when you had that kind of clarification of this is what I was doing a lot and this is what I'm, I can't do in the future, but I need to empower the team? Yeah, so so actually not just specific to me, I think to my team, I think uh, it was very, very useful. So one time when I said Werner fell on the floor was because he asked the question and we answered it wrong, okay? So he says, which division or which function is responsible for revenue, okay? And, and somehow uh, somebody gave the answer is, sales marketing, right? And Vern fell on the floor. No, that's not. It's operation. Operations are responsible for delivering revenue. So through that process, people learn, right? People, you know, you're responsible for revenue. You cannot give it to sales marketing. Sales marketing is for bringing the leads. That's for booking and for booking, um, for purchase orders. And for for re realized revenue is for is, is operations responsibility. So I'm just using that example. Uh, like you know maybe to other people it's it's uh, clear, but to at least to my team it wasn't that clear. <laughs> <laughs> so 
when when you kind of reflect on the overall journey you've been through as a inventor, scientist, entrepreneur, co-founder, and now partnering with uh, you know uh, a firm like QHP, what are some of the maybe moments or periods that really stand out that were formative? along your journey as a leader, maybe some times when you had maybe a misstep and, you know, fumbled over the hurdle, but that was actually a really good moment of growth. And some of the key times of success are like, I'm glad our team did that. And we need to do more of that. What are some of those key moments for you? Yeah. So, um, it is, you know, Applied Stem Cell was founded in 2008. So we've been around for, for a while, almost 16 years now, right? So when when I first uh, co-founded this company, so we have three co-founders, so, so I'm one of them. And I was uh, working at Stanford University um, and I was um, uh, a director of Transgenic Research Center as well as associate director of Stanford Comprehensive Cancer Center. So to most people, um, it's a very um, prestigious position working at very reputable uh, university and good position, kind of stable, <laughs> you know, and a lot of people can retire from there, right? And um, so, so when we first started, so I, I worked, I still stayed at Stanford and work as a consultant. Uh, for the company. And then, of course, the company evolves and um, we have to start, you know, raising money to support product development. And and also at that point, I have to make a decision, right? So, um, and so there's several things. One thing is investors don't want to invest into your company if the, the, the scientific founders don't even believe in, you know, her own business, like not working in a company. And then, and then also there's, you know, some conflict of interest, right? So you're working at Stanford, you cannot really like share information between the university and, and company. So um, I guess that was like a first crossroad, you know, I was experiencing. But now looking back, I, I'm so happy that I made that decision to come to uh, the apply stem cell. And, um, and so I, I just feel that working at apply stem cell, uh, we can make a bigger impact. I'm not saying basic research is not important, but this is more, much closer to my heart, like what I like to do. I can see impact and closer to saving human lives. That's really the ultimate goal of what we, we're doing here, right? is to save human lives. So just for that belief, I, I feel that, you know, for my, at least for my own career, I think I I have made the right choice um, to do what I'm doing today. And running the company, um, it has, has been very um, uh, eventful. Let's, let's say that, right? And every entrepreneur probably have stories. And uh, during, the course of the 16 years, um, we probably had a couple of times um, we uh, running out of funding and we can just close, you know, like they're very close to that. And when the, uh, at the earlier days, um, so um, the other co-founder, Ru Hong and I, uh, we, were, we, we actually had to put our own money in to save the company, right? So those things happen. Were there times when- startup company. Were there times when you couldn't make payroll and you're like, all right, bank account, 401k? Oh, yeah, of course. So we had to reduce our salary, uh, cut our salary, and we had to put in our personal money in, in order to pay other people. Right. So these are the things entrepreneur will have to sacrifice. Right. So and especially when we first started a company, we never I had to pay, you know, take a pay cut. You know, academic doesn't pay that well anyway, right? <laughs> and then come to a company I had to make a pay cut, right? So th those are the sacrifices that we have to make as an entrepreneur. I, I was looking at our annual 
you like our 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 tax returns and i'm like this is going in the wrong direction <laughs> this should be going up not down <laughs> and, and you're you an entrepreneur yes yeah in, in, in there were months when uh you know there were two months last year when i i didn't take salary because we wanted to go hire people and we need to have a little bit of a buffer and that meant tightening the belt and putting on a smile and moving forward and that's just one instance there was a time when i remember this like i think we had less than $500 in the bank account. And I took a screenshot of it. And the next day we got a wire from a deal that we closed and it was $125,000 in the bank account. I'm like, this is entrepreneurship. <laughs> I do not want to have these huge up and downs anymore. And then I was like, you know what? This is just going to get bigger. And the, the risks are going to get bigger when you have you know, 10, 50, a hundred employees, it's just going to change. And it was just about developing the mental skill set of how to handle it. Yeah. It, it definitely builds personality. It's <laughs> like, um, yeah. So it, basically we're, you know, uh, more prepared to weather the storm, you know, anything. And also, you know, I, I, I am more, optimistic because of that because you know as far you know as long as we believe in what we do we, we um really work on it and we are able to solve all these problems persistence yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this we went on a lot of different topics and and uh, apologize to the audience for my lack of uh, science knowledge and the questions, but thank you, Ruby, for, for helping. And this has been a fascinating episode. I really appreciate you taking the time for it. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you, Jordan.